This is the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast, hosted by Joe Yule. Each new moon, we'll explore with our guests how to think globally and act locally with ecofeminism. Awaken all your senses. The spirit of the witches comes to your ears. the Gang of Witches Ibiza podcast. Our last episode until after the summer break and the ending of series one. We'll be back with you in September, but right now there are 20 episodes for you to dig into. So please do come and follow us on Instagram meantime at Gang of Witches so we can keep in touch. Now, So much has changed since we last got together with the devastating overturning of the Roe versus Wade law stateside, which we will be discussing a little bit later on in today's episode. But also the refugee crisis or number of those displaced by war has risen to more than 100 million people for the first time in modern history. A fact I wouldn't have known had I not spotted it on the Instagram stories of today's guest, a documentary maker, photographer, filmmaker, activist and eco-feminist. Alice Aidy is also co-founder of Earthrise Studio, which has just had its second birthday and caught my eye when I witnessed the work Alice produced camped on the edge of a little Polish town to set up a studio and document the displacement caused by war outside a sports centre with National Geographic. Her work brings a certain sense of rawness, edginess, but first and foremost, real humanity to stories that are too often shown as one-dimensional and her portraits of refugees capture so much more than just human struggle. They transmit the real humanness of not just struggle, but also defiance, strength and grace of those caught up in one of the worst humanitarian crises of our time. Alice, thank you so much for coming to join us for today's episode. Thank you so much for having me I've, I've heard so much about this and then my I call her my mother-in-law she's not actually technically my mother-in-law yet but um Rebecca Frain was on your podcast and had such a wonderful time so I'm happy to be here thank you not yet not yet <laughs> you've got some news for us yeah <laughs> no can you imagine exclusive announcement on gang gang of witches my partner doesn't even know but it, this is it this is the announcement uh, <laughs> if you're listening <laughs> subtle hint very subtle um, okay I mean, first off, I mean, I really want to just say that I'm, you know, a huge admirer of your work as a storyteller and the way you bring, you know, really delicate, but slightly dark uh, and also very sensitive subjects into the light um, and display them in such a way that inspires people to try and take action, which I'm kind of feeling lately is just becoming so much harder. And I just wonder when it was that you realised you wanted to share this kind of narrative. How did it all begin? (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> okay, let's go back in time. So I, I grew up um, in my teens wanting to be a conflict photographer. I was really inspired by journalists, um, war photographers, people who I guess at that time, you know, I, I may have used the language of we're, we're shining a light in the dark, we're being witnesses to history. And, and for me, I felt that was um, something that I would love to do. I studied history and politics at university. I knew that I would never be a print journalist, but I, wore, I, I wanted to sort of marry my passion for politics, for international relations, um, these big systemic uh, issues, conflicts, inequalities, but translate them visually um, through photography. And when I left university in 2015, it was the height of the, the refugee crisis. And, you know, hundreds of thousands of Syrians were seeking safety in Europe. And I, I sort of woke up one day realizing I, I hadn't done, well, certainly not enough, if anything, to, uh, to respond to this, this crisis very much on our doorstep. And that was the beginning of my journey. I, I started to volunteer um, in refugee camps in, in Calais in the jungle. And um, over time, I picked up a camera and started to document what I saw and 
this whole experience for me, that, that time, those early years, um, I started to teach myself photography. And I, I realized the power, I guess, of the portrait um, of photography, of intimate uh, photography to uh, humanize the people behind these massive stories, behind these massive headlines um, that were all too often, I think, fundamentally disconnected from the people that you would meet on the ground. So it was the sort of learning that, you know, through time, through building close relationships, through building trust um, and, and sharing some of those stories that, that I could play a little role, I hoped, in humanizing the crisis and therefore shifting perceptions around refugees at that time, which was, you know, you have to think back to that, that period, highly politicized issue. Um, and of course, sort of immigration, anti-immigration became a huge, uh, hugely politicized rhetoric in the UK. So learning that craft and its power, I guess, during, during that, that time and, and that the, the power and the, the potential of photography and the power of the image has carried me through, I think, to today. I'm so, yeah, I'm so glad you said that because I think, you know, you do that work capturing the humanness of refugees so well. And that was kind of how I came to discover your work because I was also making um, a, an episode of the podcast series actually on refugees coming over from Algeria to Formentera. There's a real kind mm. of through way there. Interesting. And yeah, I think that's obviously, you know, one of the ways that you obviously connected to Jack when you spent a little bit of time in Calais. So that's, you know, I know you guys have just turned two as well with Earthrise, and that was kind of the beginning of all of that for you. I mean, I, I'm not sure if you're willing <laughs> to share the full version of that story, or maybe we can just have the practical version of it. But <laughs> tell us a little bit about, you know, that kind of meeting of minds um, over there in France. How gory do you want the details, Joe? I mean, that's I the mean, question. <laughs> no. I'll leave that up to you. <laughs> so... Um, it's, it, it's a beautiful way to put it, a meeting of minds. Um, so I, I meet Jack in 2016, so about a year after I begin this work and beyond Calais, I started to travel to um, camps across Greece, across the Middle East, Lebanon and Iraq. And um, I, I meet Jack uh, one day in October 2016 and um, we sort of have a, have a tea and, and one, of the, one of the remarkable things about that camp was the sort of cafes and things that sprung up in this sort of informal town. And we, we have a tea and start to just, you know, have an explosion of <laughs> creative ideas and talk about photography and photojournalism and the power of it and what we were passionate about. And I guess I had, you know, as I said, studied history and politics but I hadn't met someone who, like me, was passionate about ch channeling that into documentary and photography. So we meet on that day um, and we stayed in touch. He sort of expressed a, a, a passion to learn more about the crisis. Um, he had a big platform and I, I saw the potential of him using his platform to talk about the issue. Um, I was working with an incredible charity called Choose Love at the time, formerly Help Refugees. And um, he joined us for a trip. Now, it was meant to be me, Jack and Josie, the incredible co-founder of Choose Love. She had a family emergency. I didn't have anything to do with it, but it ended up just being Jack and I on this trip. And um, nothing untoward happened. It was purely professional. We were both in relationships. But certainly by the end of the week, I think we realized that we you know had so much in common that we want we saw the world the same way that we had a shared value system and there were moments you know we would spend hours in the car and in really challenging conditions meeting families that I'd met over the year previously going into refugee camps um, and there were definitely moments we would sort of be in this car driving from place to place and, and speak about how you know we would wanted a, a partner we could travel with and make work with and, and there would be a sort of slight awkward silence as we try not to have our eyes meet um, and the, fo the following months, you know, was a sort of totally inevitable, yeah, shared um, friendship. But I, I think I was really lucky in a way, I think, to meet as friends, to meet professionally um, and platonically. You know, I often look back and think, might it have been different if we'd met under different circumstances? But months later, um, we would sort of uh, split from our respective partners. And we yeah embarked on a sort of professional relationship but also a romantic relationship and we have been collaborators <laughs> colleagues collaborators in love and life <laughs> since then and from jack um i learned a huge amount about the climate crisis and i remember looking back at those early conversations thinking back to them 
And, you know, he would say, but, you know, climate change is this sort of all-encompassing issue. And I would say, but conflict is happening now. Refugee camps, uh, refugees are living in camps right now. Um, and for me, uh, when we came together, it was a real penny drop moment that this is, climate is not an issue of, of the future as I thought it was. It was an issue of the, the here and now. And that actually it would be this umbrella issue that would exacerbate all the social justice issues I cared about. So understanding that climate change would cause the biggest mass migration in history, for example. So everything I'd seen and would continue to see over the four years that I was really focused on refugee and forced, refugee movements and forced migration would be exacerbated by climate change. The, the pain, um, the, the suffering of being forced from your home, either from climate or conflict, would, is only going to get exponentially worse. And realising that sort of intersection um, that also, of course, exists with racial injustice, with gender injustice, that climate was at the heart of all these issues, which was a huge shift for me. Um, and Jack and I came together, I guess, in a shared passion of the power of human stories from climate front lines. You know, we love, we love the David Attenboroughs, we love the Blue Planets. They made us fall in love with nature. We credit them for that. But um, we were really passionate about sharing the, the human rights element of this, the human stories from people living on the front lines for whom this was already an everyday reality. And so for the next few years, we would we'd start to document those stories. And you mentioned Earthrise. Well, it is two years, just two years old, which feels like a huge amount of time, but also not remotely enough to describe the, uh, well, the pleasure, the, 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 the chaos of uh, running a startup. But we, we started that in the midst of the pandemic. So imagine, as we all were, we're forced into isolation, the ex excruciating isolation for, for me, particularly as someone who would often pick up my camera, travel to where stories were unfolding. And we were really sort of creatively challenged. How do we tell stories in a different way from where we live? And that, that sort of those creative limitations forced us to really think differently. And that was the birth of Earthrise, which has developed to become this sort of production company, creative studio focused on multimedia storytelling um, for climate. And that has meant, you know, platforming activists from around the world, platforming stories from around the world, using graphic design, harnessing, uh, you know, multimedia storytelling, building social impacts, everything from around documentary series, documentary films, um, partnering with uh, brands who are, you know, pioneering sustainability like Stella McCartney or uh, we worked with Penguin last year to build the social impact campaign around their environmental classic series uh, a brilliant series of books called Green Ideas so it's been a, a baptism of fire as we like to say but what I've loved about it is the diverse storytelling approaches that we've taken to um, the issue of climate and really developed in our journey since I met Jack you know, in that, in that refugee camp and, and how we've diversified the way that we tell stories, um, who we platform, how we platform them. Uh, and yeah, collaborations just kind of deepened, I guess, and exponentially <laughs> amplified. Wow. <laughs> I mean, I love a good love story. That is actually possibly one of the best ones I've ever heard. Um, <laughs> and, you know, like when you share such uh, amazing passions for, you know, similar kinds of things, I mean, those are the moments I think that, you know, were just there and, and always meant to happen. I mean, you've covered displacement as a theme heavily since you started as a photographer and a filmmaker and the things, you know, they're gathering pace, as you've just said, they're getting worse, they're not going to get better, and especially not at the moment with, as we just said in the introduction about, you know, things being um, the worst they've ever been in modern history. So I think, you know, not just due to war, but also due to the climate, um, this is going to increase. But, you know, what's it been like to start working on a subject matter that is so heart wrenching? I mean, how are you how are you dealing with that in your work? It's a it's a really good question. And it's one I, I honestly struggle with because understanding my role as um, the storyteller and not the person who's experiencing it so I can never compare you know my experience of dropping in and dropping out parachuting into these situations and then the ability to leave when you know this is people's lived experience um, and and what I experience will never compare to that having said that um, you know it is really difficult I think uh, 
what you see in a lot of storytellers, documentarians and photojournalists certainly is the sort of stereotype of the the chain smoking, alcoholic, sort of desensitized war photographer because they've seen so much. They've had to emotionally detach themselves. And I think that was, you know, I've seen that time and time again. And, I, and that's a, a big fear that I never want that to be me. So you have to remain emotionally engaged, show up uh, in the best way possible for the people that you're documenting. And that requires you to be, you know, in a good, good state of mental health. And, and for me, that's an ongoing journey of understanding how to do that. I think I look back at the early years and I, I was hugely emotionally impacted by, by what I saw. Um, I don't think I, I understood how to create boundaries. I was hugely emotionally invested and I still am. Um, I think what I've had to learn to do is process the emotion much more immediately. So my, while I might have before really bottled it up, not understood or known how to process it in that moment, I would really hold it in my body, the grief, the, you know, a big sense of guilt. And I think a big shift for me has been shifting a sense of guilt into a sense of responsibility. And they're very different driving forces. Um, I think shifting from guilt to responsibility is a much more productive driving force to, to get me out of bed every single day um, and I never want to forget that sense of responsibility. Now when I go on trips, I was recently um, just a few days after the outbreak of war on the Ukrainian border and you know I really noted I found myself being incredibly sort of emotional every evening when I got back to the hotel room and um, that is obviously reflective of the immense trauma of, of the, the people being forced to leave their homes in those early days. It was huge chaos. We didn't know what was coming down the line. Of course, we're a few months into that war and it's still ongoing. Um, but I've had to learn to process it much more immediately. And fundamentally, I think I am driven by a, a sheer optimism um, in the power, the resilience and the strength of people. And I sort of can never really forget that. You're never going to forget that. I mean, I think, you know, I guess when you started out on this journey, I, be I bet you never, ever thought that you'd be kind of documenting a war and nobody wants to be in that position because ultimately we all, you know, stay optimistic and hope that there will never be one. I mean, it was all, you know, very fast and, and very shocking for, you know, what's unfolded and the situation that it's left us all in. I mean, you've been to the front lines of climate change, but I think, you know, I bet you never thought perhaps that you would end up sort of on the front lines um, of you know of war and and the fallout from that, but most recently, you, as you just described, you went to the Ukraine shortly after the war was actually declared uh, for National Geographic. I mean, you've spoken about obviously what it's like for you, but what was it? You know, what can you just maybe give us a small insight as to how it was to be in the midst of you know perhaps the women and children that were forced to flee to safety and and to be you know residing in that environment in the refugee camp there. Mm, I think you raise a good point. You know, there was something really notable about this and um, it happens to some degree with other migration movements but with the Ukraine uh, it was just women and children on the whole and um, you know the men were were forced to leave and so those it was it's a very gendered kind of refugee movement and not only was there the the pain of having to be forced from home those early days I mean just terror of people as this was unfolding day to day and the situation was developing people who'd literally left towns cities that were being destroyed um, or that were, were forced to leave in anticipation of that happening to their own homes um, I think we clearly as a global community massively underestimated Russia and I think it was for many of us a shock um, to Ukrainians not not so much I imagine so what was it like those first few days? You know, chaos, super, super heightened emotions, absolutely freezing cold. Um, people left with just as, as, as little as they could to be as mobile as they could. Um, days, took them days to leave the country, hugely long queues at the, at the border to even leave. Um, train journeys lasting, you know, 24 hours or more, apparently, everyone is sort of trying to get rest, children sleeping on the floor, um, people climbing over each other to even get to the toilet on the trains, such a, such a queue of trains trying to leave the country. Um, so panic, fear, terror, just an unfolding 
as as the unfolding reality um occurred but notably i would say you know a huge number of the the mothers and the wives and the partners just grieving the fact that they'd have had to leave their their men so to speak um at home and just the the devastating uncertainty of that mm-hmm. thank you alice sorry i'm sure that you know really must um drum up quite a lot of emotion to mm-hmm. to recall those early days and i i feel like for them to be so unprepared in the ukraine and I, as you say for every for all the men had to have to stay behind and to fight and for it to be i remember reading a post that you put up directly in, in the aftermath of that about it being you know predominantly the women and the children that were not just affected because obviously people that stay behind have clearly affected also yeah. but to be in that predicament of being completely homeless with almost nothing in such dire circumstances i mean yeah. it's very difficult to understand as you say through the lens of instagram or or the press um and and to hear it kind of firsthand feels important to understand fully the kind of implications of of what all of this really means i think in terms of the work that you do with choose love um the charity that supports refugees and obviously you know you have your work with choose earth the spin-off of that i saw you doing something beautiful with um cosmic pineapple here in ibiza just recently as well um and uh, you know the, the proceeds of that event going towards choose earth which is which is beautiful but what you know what do you feel that the largest driver of displacement is uh, in what is turning into the greatest humanitarian crisis in modern history uh i think it will increasingly be climate uh at the moment the the biggest driver is uh conflict i think we have an unprecedented number 100 million refugees and displaced people uh, across the world and to me this as we've said is only an issue that's going to grow and so the increasing challenge as a storyteller is how to shift perspectives and challenge perspectives on refugees i mean being on the ukrainian border it was a kind of big wake up call and and i i remember trying to share reflections about this at the time but there was a real uh i want to say double standard but also for me to try and understand how to um hold both realities to celebrate what i saw on the border as this kind of extraordinary volunteer response an amazing response of europeans to ukrainian refugees forced to leave their home but also how different that felt from the response of europe to syrian refugees and the same borders that were you know opening their arms and letting ukrainians through were uh absolutely closed patrolled uh beating Syrians with with batons literally um so the difference in response and what that reflects back to us about you know our own racism xenophobia or islamophobia when the refugees don't look like us or have a different religion how different our response is and i think ukraine has only taught us that we need to massively shift our perception of refugees that refugees can be you and i of and they are but we have to have shared empathy for refugees from all around the world whether they're from afghanistan you know it's not so long ago there was a huge crisis in afghanistan and it just leaves headlines so quickly and you know it's the same with the ukraine it's difficult for me even to reflect on how quickly you know life moves on even though i was there in the early days and and the the suffering continues so yeah a big big lesson i think for us that we need to sort of have a shared shared empathy a shared response to refugees from from all around the world and i have to say that was kind of a big wake up call um being on the ukrainian border and seeing the difference mm. i think as you rightly pointed out i mean you know climate was always eventually going to cause this level of displacement from from the information that we received but it's almost like which came first the chicken or the egg because obviously the situation was unforeseen with the conflict that's arisen but all of that other displacement that you talk about and equally you know what's going on with britain and rwanda and that kind of shipment that's you know on the cards potentially to take people over there as well and what we heard about people in ukraine um you know being allowed to escape based on racial equality it was like really yeah. devastating to yeah. to read that um in the papers and again without being there it was very hard to decipher you know what felt real and and what was really happening um mm. so it was i think in many ways 
with the invasion of Russia, it was very difficult to kind of work out who was most affected by those circumstances. But what, you know, what initially inspired you? I was very surprised when I when I saw that you were actually there on the front line. What made you, you know, go directly there so soon after that happened? Well, I was in, um, I was actually in Brazil and, and that was part of my work with Choose Earth that you mentioned, um, working with indigenous communities across Brazil. And I was on a trip there and I had about five days left of the trip and I got a phone call from a colleague of mine, an amazing um, photojournalist and a mentor and a dear friend, Anastasia Taylor Lind. And her name comes up. I receive a call from her. I look down at my phone. And the moment I saw her name, I, I just felt this is, this is going to be something about Ukraine. And I knew that or felt that because Anastasia's done a huge amount of work there already um, over the course of her career. I pick up the phone. She tells me there's an assignment with National Geographic and would I like to go? I'd have to leave as soon as possible and make the decision within the next hour and start uh, what was a sort of mammoth journey from Brazil to the Ukrainian border. And um, <laughs> it took me about, I think, five minutes. And I, I, I sort of think the moment I saw her name, I, I knew that I, I should go. It was just fully coming to terms with what that meant and also just going into such an uncertain and unfolding situation. But very quickly I decide to do it and I start a sort of 36 hour journey home. I get back, um, I didn't have most of my gear. I swap my Brazil clothes, it was summer, so <laughs> dresses, you know, short sleeves and um, I quickly within literally a few hours change my suitcase to be filled with every layer and warmest item of clothing I have a huge duffel jacket a flak jacket and a helmet fill my bag and um, leave London and and arrive on the Ukrainian Polish border and what drove me to do it I think you know you just I I didn't feel I I just felt a strong responsibility to do so Um, it was it was unequivocal really I'm not sure I of course I had the choice but I, I I felt very much driven to be there Um, and you know forced migration has been a massive part of my work I've been so focused on climate recently um it was important for me to respond and you know in those moments you know you mentioned the press we're reading this stuff it's overwhelming you don't know you're desperate to to make an impact somehow and help we all felt that um and I know that that was my way of helping it may be a tiny tiny drop in the ocean but I absolutely felt that's what I needed to do in that moment, um, I, I, I really felt there was no other choice, and I'm very happy I did that. Once upon a time, in Ibiza, with Alex Gray. I choose love, I choose life, I choose the earth all rise. A passionate pursuit of visual perception, a responsibility to demystify the chronic destruction. A destruction of our earth, our mind, body, soul, human stories screaming to be told. An endless sky of hope, an eternal sea of truth, a melting forest of wisdom. Our lungs choke. The earth beckons our aching hearts. It shakes, it trembles with ecstasy, with love. Life plays on amidst the suffering and deception How can we alter the other perception? An indigenous existence, this evolutionary resistance, risking life for the air that we breathe with a relentless persistence. The story is you. The story is me. There is no them and us. There is only we. Dance the rhythms of this chaotic web. Live the questions with noble intentions to show the way to make a change. Cosmic vibrations weaving the stars. I gaze from above. I incarnate as the wild feminine bare feet on the grass. Rooting into the earth with a matrix of magic. I choose now to be the time. A time to be wild with courage and freedom, weaver, earth keeper, water guardian, sacred seeker. The gift of life held in the hand, kneel down, kiss the earth, a woman I am. You 
you're incredibly brave and yeah I mean I've been in a similar well mildly similar situation in my reporting work and I was terrified I really didn't want to go anywhere near when I was um doing the London um tube bombings mm. and there was I was just so so frightened and I remember you know always wanting to be a war correspondent of some description but I think when the you know when push comes to shove it's interesting to see you know that your call was to go and there was no hesitation there whereas I I was just yeah not feeling the same at all so I'm uh, hats off to you to be honest well and, it, and I I should definitely add to that that being on the border was completely different to being you know, in the capital, and there are amazing journalists and and mm -hmm. um, photographers who really were in 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 the heart of the eye of the storm. And you know, Lindsay Adario, who I assisted for many years, is one of them, an incredible American photojournalist, and she was literally on the front lines, risking her life with bombs dropping yards away from her. So, um, huge, huge admiration for their bravery and, and courage. It's 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 truly remarkable. Mm, absolutely, and um, yeah. You know, we just don't hear enough either about those people that do go to the front lines to do that reporting work, because how else are we actually going to really understand what's actually happening um, apart from what we're being fed? Let's let's talk about the trip um, that you say that you actually returned from to go to the Ukraine, obviously to, to Brazil, slightly different weather climate um, into the uh, is it the Chingu? territory Chingu, yeah. in the Brazilian Amazon to meet indigenous female leaders, because Obviously, the stakes in Brazil couldn't be any higher with deforestation at peak rates in 15 years. So, I mean, can you tell us a bit more um, from the ground there? I mean, why is it that Bolsonaro systematically is legalizing deforestation across the country? And what actual threat does this really pose to the indigenous communities who seem to be more under threat than ever before? Mm. So this year in Brazil, um, as you say, literally the stakes couldn't be higher. There's an election that's going to be happening on October 2nd um, and Bolsonaro is going for re-election against the former president of Brazil, Lula. Bolsonaro um, is, as you say, sort of slowly but surely dismantling the layers of policy that protect the Amazon. He is decriminalizing the deforestation of the Amazon and that is uh, because of the Brazilian government's links with agribusiness. So really this is, you know, a, a business game. The Amazon is close to tipping point, and um, I think when we talk about the Amazon, I think we we all too often forget that the Amazon is not just the, the the lungs of the earth; it is also, in some ways, the heartbeat. And there are indigenous communities actively protecting it. The fact that there is any Amazon rainforest left is entirely due to the indigenous communities who protect that biodiversity. Indigenous communities across the world are five percent of the world population protecting 82% of global biodiversity. I find that fact unbelievably staggering. It never sort of fails to take my breath away. Um, we should be taking them seriously as the world's climate leaders, the real conservationists. And um, we're entirely indebted to them really for the air that we breathe um, in terms of how they've protected biodiversity and their human rights in Brazil are fundamentally on the line. And when I look back at my journey from studying history and politics, documenting refugee uh, movements, human rights, and more recently climate change, I can see that actually focusing on indigenous rights, the indigenous struggle and storytelling around indigenous communities is the culmination of every story I've ever told. In and of their struggle, they embody that intersection of human rights and social justice with environment, environmental justice. And this is the kind of critical reframing that's happening in the climate movement that's really important of not just understanding climate change as an environmental problem, as a nature problem, but a climate justice issue. Who are the people who are disproportionately impacted? How is this fundamentally a human rights issue? And how can we as a global community support um, indigenous rights? So. It's become a huge focus of my work over the past two years, and I've been traveling back and forth to Brazil. That work is taking many forms, and one of them is Choose Earth, this fundraising campaign to support 64 indigenous leaders. And I've been so incredibly lucky to get to know the indigenous movement, uh, resistance movement, some of the key indigenous leaders, um, 
in Brazil. And I cannot tell you how fundamentally inspiring that's been um, in the way they're resisting, in the way they're communicating, in the way that they're building movement. This is an extraordinary grassroots movement. And I seriously, every time I come back, I'm taking notes about um, how, how incredible that network is of resistance. A historic number of Indigenous women are running for election this year, um, and it's a story that I'm tracking very closely in Brazil. There's a massive paradigm shift happening, but the forces that they're fighting against are hugely entrenched, hugely patriarchal, and it is you know, expressed by many of the Indigenous people that I've met that this is the most dangerous time to be an Indigenous person. And to say that, given the history of you know, genocide, frankly, that they've experienced to say that they feel more under threat now than ever is is truly uh, remarkable. I mean, that's just devastating to, to hear that they're, you know, fighting for their lives and not just their land. I mean, it's just, you know, inconceivable that 82 percent of the, that biodiversity is, is in the hands of those people and they're completely and utterly you know, vulnerable, really, yeah. and under attack on a, on a constant basis. You know, a, a prime example of that um, arose in, in a more kind of local way in my head, just because last month, um, Brazilian police confirmed that one of two bodies discovered in the Amazon rainforest in Brazil was a British journalist and former Mixmag editor, Dom Phillips, mm. which I think... Well, it was very, very, you know, I didn't even know that Dom was out there doing that kind of stuff. And as you can imagine, on an island like this one, there's been a lot of uh, talk um, in the community. And obviously that felt like a massive blow for those of the people that knew him and his plight to tell those indigenous stories that we're talking about here. I mean, personally, from your experience there, have you felt that kind of fear or terror that those people um, are under? And what have they actually been um, telling you when you've been on those kinds of trips and what's the first, you know, maybe the worst thing that you've encountered or most scary thing that you've perhaps come up against? Does it feel threatening in, in your world to be there? So Dom, Dom and Bruno, who you mentioned, yeah, they're, that's absolutely tragic a story that really reflects the extent to which um, there is a war on the Amazon, so to speak, led by Bolsonaro and to think that these are, you know, one British journalist, one Brazilian, um, Bruno, they're non-Indigenous. And, it, you know, it just goes to show that the level of uh, deaths and threat that Indigenous communities are under. And they're literally receiving death threats. And these are not death threats from uh, not only sort of online. This is very, very real. So Sonia Guajajara, who's um, an extraordinary pioneering female leader who's running for federal congresswoman, she's receiving death threats from government officials. Um, so the level of uh, security threat that they're under, they are risking their lives, they need security, their own children need security. Um, it's, it's, it is a life or death situation, it can't be exaggerated. You know, I think as environmentalists and activists in the UK, we take our own freedom for granted, of, although, of course, uh, the government is increasingly strict and, and limiting those freedoms to the right of protest. But we are not risking our life in the way that communities in Brazil and indeed across South America are. Um, it's, it's really, really high stakes. And I'm encountering that all the time. I've been lucky to not be personally threatened. Um, but there is no doubt that, uh, you know, working in the way that Dom and Bruno have been uh, it is you are you can be risking your life what actual work i mean i heard that they were writing a book i mean obviously you know there's some people that have been caught and hopefully are gonna pay the price for what happened to dom and bruno but I, it just feels like they were completely out there doing their own obviously investigative work which obviously needs to be done but then you know we're obviously seeing as as you say more reportage of of what happened to them but more so than we would of actually what's really happening there yeah, I mean, it's unbelievable to think that for writing a book, for independent research, for independent documentation, they lost their lives. But that is the situation. We're talking about journalism. We're talking about just standing as allies with the indigenous movement. And, you know, the indigenous movement themselves are getting murdered. I mean, in the days following the discovery of, of Dom and Bruno's body, there was the murder of um, the Guarani Kaiwa, another uh, an indigenous community, um, by police. I mean, this is this is the everyday reality for indigenous communities. And so... How, you know, as a storyteller, do we 
communicate that sense of urgency to the world. This is every single day we're losing the Amazon and we're losing indigenous lives. Um, and so how can we tell stories around indigenous communities that are always, I think to many, you know, here living in the UK, it feels abstract, it feels far away. How do we understand that indigenous rights are relevant to our own lives? That's kind of the challenge that I've taken on narratively. How do we work with indigenous communities for the, to empower them to tell their own stories, which have so often been told for them, you know, been full of stereotyping. Um, I think people have such a sort of romanticized view around indigenous communities. And I, I think to anchor it in the urgent political context, the urgent reality of, of it being life threatening is, is a huge um, focus for me and, and a big, you know, narrative challenge too to communicate how important the struggle is. I think, as you said, you know, they're also going to be in the same boat. Not only is it, a, you know, a conflict and a war in, in the jungle, but it's also, you know, these people will also lose their homes, just like the people in the Ukraine. It's going to be the same situation, but in a different context. I think it's hugely important and you're doing amazing work to to bring that to the forefront and in terms of storytelling i saw um a ted talk with um fahana yamin a british lawyer and climate activist who gave a talk on how we need to become climate jedis in london and one of the things that she was saying was that the world needs storytelling just as much as scientists right now and i think greta thunberg was also saying the same thing recently in a speech that i saw her give and it was so good as well to see her speaking at Glastonbury. So, I mean, where do we feel the biggest access point is to get that message across about this level of urgency and the important work that needs to be done together? And where do you begin even doing the, you know, the kind of work that you do do to get that across? I think the best advice that I ever received was find your role um, in the movement. You know, I traveled to, to climate front lines across the world, Kiribati and Island, South Pacific, Somalia during a drought, um, trips to document the, the human cost of the climate crisis. It put me into a state of utter terror, to be honest. And, you know, I, I found myself on a journey into activism, into direct action. And I found myself increasingly in despair. And uh, at some point, I really had to kind of come to some, some kind of reckoning and, and ask myself, what, what can I offer this movement? And, you know, none of us can take it all, every part of it on our shoulders. It, it's, it's, it's an unbearable weight and it's just not possible. So to refine and find your focus and your way to contribute, I think was um, a kind of catharsis for me and there was a liberation in it. And for me, you know, it became... It fueled my passion for the storytelling that I could do. And I do think that storytelling around the crisis um, is a huge, huge part of the puzzle here. Um, you know, we've had the science. The science is incredibly important. But scientists have been shouting from the rooftops for 50 years. We've known the situation. We've known the science. Um, I think what we fail to do is tell the story properly. And part of that is that we've been very good at communicating the problem shouting about the problem, um, but not so good at convincing people that another world is possible, that a better, better alternative, a better world is also possible and can exist. Uh, I think people feel powerless. I think they feel overwhelmed. They bury their heads in the sand. I think despair, you know, we, despair has almost become a, a, as big a threat as denial. And so I'm not a get day goes by that I don't ask myself, how can I contribute to storytelling that gives people a sense of agency, that gives them the sense that they can make a difference, that activism will mean different things to different people, that there is a better world, a greener, fairer, better world um, that we need to reach for. But how can I, as a storyteller, paint a picture, collaborate with creatives, be they filmmakers, uh, photographers, graphic designers, whatever the, those those skills are how can we harness creativity harness storytelling to imagine and visualize that better world because if we can paint a picture of it if it can feel just within reach I think we're much more likely to get there people feel that no alternative is possible I think they've lost sight of the idea that we're not inherently greedy that we can be better that we can create a better system that this is not the inevitable end that capitalism in its current form isn't the best that we can do we can do better we can be better we can build better community um 
So that's the driving force and the guiding principle behind my work now and fundamentally the work that we do with Earthrise and hope and optimism have to be at the core of that. Um, and that's for myself, you know, I, I see myself as on a lifelong journey for this. I don't think this is going to be resolved. Um, I think we use the language of fighting climate change, tackling climate change. I think I've reached a point of acceptance that, um, you know, a lot of the, the devastation is coming down the line, that the destruction, even if we switched off all fossil fuels, even today, so much of it is locked in. So if you come to a level of acceptance that um, there will be irre irreversible change and damage, but that we can limit the devastation from this point onwards, we should absolutely dedicate ourselves to doing that. I mean, that was what I was going to ask you, actually. I think, you know, you've kind of summed it up there. But, you know, I once saw a lecture um, by Brian Eno at the Brighton Festival talking about the reasons You're mentioning so many legends. <laughs> Fahana, <laughs> Brian, amazing allies to this movement. Absolutely. I mean, he's obviously doing his thing with music now and, yep. um, you know, taking Earth Percent forward to try and get musicians to collaborate, which I think is a really, really important movement. We so talked about important. that with with um, Marina Ponte from the SDG, the UN mm. director. But I, I think, it, you know, it's, I feel like optimism, I think that's the number one reason, you know, why your work is, is brilliant and, you know, inspires a lot of women that I'm speaking to. For example, I spoke to Arizona Muse, who mm. has the charity Dirt, who's mm. trying to kind of, you know, push this biodynamic farming movement forward to heal the soil. And, and one of the things that she says is that, you know, being an activist basically means that she's having all these very inspiring conversations on a daily basis. So she's not feeling this sense of like extreme eco anxiety, which mm. I think is very easy to fall down the trap of, understandably. I know that you and Finn and Jack have all suffered from that mm. at Earthrise. And I think, you know, how do you actually maintain that if you're not doing the work of, a, of an activist every day? I mean, a lot of people clearly have other kinds of things to focus on mm. and must do on a daily basis. But I mean, how do you? stay um, away from that huge quagmire of inaction and, and the feelings of apathy? What's your number one? How can you harness hope in these times? I think that hope is, is, is an active choice. It's not a passive thing, um, nor is it, you know, naive to be hopeful. I think that you can stare the situation that we're in straight in the face, um, but remain to choose to be hopeful and optimistic and let that drive you. And how do I find hope? I find hope in taking action. I think the key bit about, you know, the, the language, the framework about being an activist is really making that as inclusive and accessible as possible. Being an activist will mean different things to different people. It will mean different things for me than it does for Arizona. It will mean different things to, you know, people across the world. And I think it's about finding your role, understanding how you can contribute, what activism means to you. And, you know, I love that Arizona says it's about conversations. You know, activism can be starting a conversation with a friend, with a family member, um, bringing this stuff up. Uh, I think it means so many different things to different people. But for me, it's taking action and it's taking action through storytelling and contributing in the way that I, I know how, you know, telling stories, humanizing the crisis, sharing an optimistic and hopeful perspective of the world, asking questions, being curious, challenging the status quo, um, all of those things, uh, you know, give me hope. And, and I, fundamentally, you've mentioned some of them, you know, getting the chance to meet the Fahana Yamins, you know, we stand on the shoulders of giants. I'm unbelievably inspired by the, the pioneers and the activists, the people that have dedicated their lives to, to working on this issue that I get to meet. And I feel so lucky that, you know, my camera is a vehicle, a tool for me to meet people I never would have met, have conversations with people I never would have met. Um, so I feel incredibly privileged. And something that we always talk about at Earthrise is how lucky ultimately we are to be driven by a clear sense of purpose. And, you know, Jack, Jack often talks, you know, so many young people, I think, are totally paralysed by a sense of... Uh, yeah, powerlessness, overwhelm, anxiety. You know, I think we forget that it wasn't so long ago. I think of my parents' generation that they lived in this extraordinary time, you know, post-war, massive uh, expansion of, of growth, of development, of prosperity. And I think they genuinely did believe that tomorrow would be a better day and that uh, 
for a short time, although, as we said, we did know the science that nature was infinitely abundant, that growth was exponential. And we know that now to just fundamentally be untrue. And so many of these stories are unraveling at the seams. And I think young people have a very clear sense of that. What we're searching for more than ever is a sense of purpose. And so if we can rally around this extraordinary global unprecedented humanitarian challenge that is in our midst um if we can rally around that sense of purpose i think it, it will be fundamentally nourishing i know that it nourishes me to have that clear focus to have that clear um purpose absolutely i think sense of purpose it, it is yeah absolutely at the top of everybody's agenda currently specifically and i think I think I also wanted to, before we finish, mention, you know, that every in every single indigenous language, the earth is referred to as her. Mm. And that means that, you know, every single one of our ancestors used to think of the earth as a feminine being. Mm. And I, I mean, through the course of this series, this is actually the last episode of, of series one. We're taking a little break for the summer. But I've heard, you know, so many definitions of what that term ecofeminism means from Mareka Kole in our very, very first episode, 20 episodes ago, mm. you know, to Van Damme. Anna Shiva and obviously these ladies are a little bit older than you um, but in perhaps your own words you know I would really love to hear um, you know after everything you've seen and you've referred to in today's conversation the plight of refugees you know as being an issue that affects mostly women and children or particularly in the circumstances you've been involved in but you know would you say that you know ecofeminism is a thing for you and how would you define it in your own words? Mm. Um there's a, a great framework, which I, I always love. It's slightly tongue in cheek, but also quite profound as climate change is a man-made problem with a feminist solution. Um, and, you know, I think it's true. And I'm sure you've heard from your other incredible speakers. We've, we've, we've done generations now of patriarchal leadership, extractivist leadership. And I think we are in a period of time where we are desperately looking for different value systems, different frameworks. For me, that's why it's been so inspiring to learn from indigenous communities about a completely different way of seeing the world, a different value system. And I think I particularly, when I think of ecofeminism, I think of my friend Nina Guilinga, an incredible indigenous activist from Ecuador. And she's very passionate about, um, you know, this link between violence against women and violence against the earth. A big focus of her work is on gendered violence. And she writes incredible poetry from the perspective of Mother Earth. You know, we have um, abused uh, our planet and only taken from her. And I think that understanding our role as women and female leadership um, as a way to dramatically reframe how we view the planet and ultimately ourselves is is incredibly urgent. So I welcome, absolutely welcome definitions of ecofeminism. Um, and in many ways, I think it's a framework that should you know, lead the way uh, in coming years. Thank you. I, I think that was a, a great little uh, summary there that, that definitely works in this context. I also, you know, I don't know if you want to talk about this, but I felt like it was all a bit of a blow um, in the last month when the, the Roe versus Wade um, mm. ruling got reversed. And obviously that's had massive, massive implications for women across America. And it's, you know... I, it's impossible to ignore how that must feel um, for, for women um, there and a across the states. I know that you posted an, a very moving um, story on your Instagram page just recently, and I wondered if you, you know, would kind of give us your thoughts on on how you, you know, what this really means. Mm. It's it was a quite sort of profound moment to me. For me, I I, I to share something so incredibly personal. Um, you know, that at, at 21, I, I found out in total shock uh, and overwhelming shame uh, in the an airport toilet that I was five weeks pregnant. Um, and then very reluctantly had an abortion, which seemed like the only choice at the time and something I'm incredibly lucky to have had uh, the right to do. And of course, had I not, the course of my life would have been fundamentally different and I knew the moment the news came out that I had to say something and normally 
I think I would have responded to something like that in the way I usually do, you know, um, talking about in an abstract theoretical way about the affront to, to women's rights without talking from, from truly from the heart or from my own experience. And something in me just said, no, this is actually a time to be genuinely vulnerable. And it's, it's rare that I, I share something, you know, so private, something that I, uh, I'm constantly navigating how much to sort of share, how much to talk about my own stories when I see myself more as a vehicle to other people's. But I'm really glad that I, I did share that moment. And, you know, the response was overwhelming. Um, and many, many, many women shared their own stories. So it was a, it was a lesson for me to um, not only share, but also the catharsis and sharing and how that slightly sort of lifts the weight of the shame that I think so many women hold, be it around abortion, be it around sexual assault. Um, so, yeah, with a, with a heavy heart, I was, um, I'm happy that I am relieved that I shared that. Mm, thank you for sharing that with us. I just felt, yeah, I wasn't, um, well, I don't know what I was expecting from, from the kind of aftermath of that decision. Mm. It just... I think, you know, women worldwide and not just women, you know, like everybody has had a reaction to that. And, um, you know, there's been some very interesting um, narrative as well as to how to, you know, how to push this forward, this kind of storyline of um, actually, you know, what we can all do to help. And there's been some interesting sort of pod uh, casters coming together as well to try and emphasize places that women can go mm. um, to actually, you know, find the right information and find the right access to safe um, communities that will, will um, you know, get together and, and support one another. So I'm really grateful um, that you felt able to, to talk about that. And I think, you know, it just feels like the work you're doing is um, is really, really important as a storyteller and as an activist. And um, yeah, I'm just really, really inspired by everything I see on Earthrise and, and the places that you're going and the people you're speaking to. So yeah, thank you for speaking to us as well. It's been an absolute joy to have this conversation and um, I hope that we get to meet on Ibiza mm. in the not too distant future. Thank you so much, Jo. Such an honor to be here uh, alongside the the icons that you've had on this podcast. So I'm really grateful. Oh, thank you so much, Alice. And um, yeah, we'll hope to see you soon. It was the Ibiza podcast of Gang of Witches, hosted by Joe Yule. See you at the next new moon. Until then, take care of yourselves. Yeah.